we see a big bullseye of above average precipitation chances. Hi again, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. And we enjoy talking with you about all things related to agriculture, whether it's news or markets or what have you. Make sure you like these videos, subscribe to the videos by clicking on the bell icon down below and share these videos with others because they can use the information too. And thanks to your help, we continue to be one of the fastest growing ag podcasts out there anywhere. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all your support. Today, I'm glad to welcome aboard Justin Glisten, the state climatologist for the state of Iowa. And uh, welcome aboard, Justin. Great to have you with us here as we uh, talk about things heading into the harvest season and a lot of angst out there in some areas, especially in northwestern Iowa and the northwestern Corn Belt. They had a late start to the growing season, and now they're kind of biting their fingernails on if it'll make it to the finish line. So lots of stuff to talk about. We've had some really good growing season weather in the middle of the Corn Belt. So I'll turn it over to you. I understand you have some new information. Yeah, so great to be with you, Marlon. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you look at the state in general, uh, going back to January of, uh, of 2023, the previous 48 months, the fifth driest for the state of Iowa in 152 years of records. And now we're in the eighth wettest start for 2024. Uh, so we've had a the pendulum swing back and forth. We are out of drought. We had a, a drought buster that set up uh, earlier this year. Uh, longest drought that I was seen since the 1950s. So very widespread uh, pervasive precipitation deficits, but also lower stream flows uh, along with soil moisture profiles that were dry. However, you look at 2021 and 2022, near record yields in 2022, record yields in 2021 for corn and beans, uh, where we had uh, better conditions, timely rainfalls. Uh, but overall, the growing season this year is looking really well. In fact, we've had more rainfall as at the end of August than we did all of in 2023. And we're out running above average for much of the state. Now, of course, you mentioned northwestern Iowa. The event that happened up there in, in mid-June uh, had an annual exceedance probability of 0.01% or in the old parlance, a thousand year event. So epic amount of rainfall up there with flooding, of course. So you have some farmers and producers up that way that probably won't have a crop. Uh, and then you mentioned, uh, you know, with the late start, is that crop going to make it to the finish line? Well, if we're looking at the outlooks, we are seeing warmer temperatures forecasted in the near term, the next two weeks, but also in September and then September, October, November. So hopefully that should push the crop on. Uh, that's a little behind and uh, we're not seeing anything in the outlooks right now that suggests any type of cold snap, which is good as well. So overall, I think we're doing pretty well across the state and you look across the eastern Corn Belt, drier conditions, drought formation in Ohio and getting into Indiana. Uh, so we're kind of in the garden position, garden state right here in Iowa for uh, corn and beans. Now, you're in a, a rather unique position in that you kind of straddle the borderline of some of the best crops in the country and some of the worst. And it's all right in your responsible territory right there. Have you had a chance to drive around and, and see all the difference in the crops? Absolutely. One of my favorite things to do is field scouting with our field agronomist from Iowa State Extension, or just take the back roads uh, instead of going I-35 or I-80, take the back roads to the presentations that I give or when I'm meeting with farmers or producers uh, to get an idea of what the variability of the crop looks like. Uh, we drove to Wisconsin last week or uh, last month. Uh, the crop in eastern Iowa looked really good uh, from the road. But again, as you mentioned, there is variability. There are uh, some rougher patches in western Iowa getting up into northwestern Iowa. And then we've had shorter term uh, precipitation deficits uh, in southwestern Iowa and then even in northeastern Iowa, where we've seen a reintroduction of that D0 category on the drought monitor. Abnormally dry conditions, again, not drought, but more a reflection of 30 to 60 day precipitation deficits. Now, without these timely rainfalls that we've seen in parts of the state, 
We've actually been cooler than average uh, in summer, about a half degree below average. And we really only had two or three days recently, in fact, last week, <clears throat> when temperatures were in the upper 90s uh, in low triple digits uh, with a, a lot of, of low level relative humidity. So it kind of mitigated some of that moisture stress as well. But as you aptly point out, there is variability out there. <clears throat> but overall, it's looking pretty good. What kind of a stage would you say the crops are in maturity wise? Let's let's talk about corn here first. Um, in in your opinion, I mean, is it getting close to harvest time in the east or or not? Yeah. So de again, depending on where you are, <clears throat> we're really approaching that maturity black layer uh, in the earlier planted corn. We heard of uh, some sweet corn being planted down in Sheridan back in February. <laughs> Uh, second warmest and driest February on record. We had the second warmest winter on record with a really strong El Nino. Uh, so that helped us get into the field and get planted. Now, of course, with wetter conditions in spring, we've had some replant uh, and some slower, uh, slower physiologically maturing corn and beans. But we're getting there. And with this, this warmth that we're seeing in early September, <clears throat> along with that drier signal in the outlooks, uh, we're really going to push the crop uh, um, in the next few weeks. So what do you think that did overall, let's say in the northwestern half of Iowa there, where it did, like you say, you had to replant in some cases. I've heard guys say they had to replant two and three times. Yeah. Um, so it really put them behind the eight ball. Now, I used to grow sweet corn out there uh, in uh, the plains. And I know the corn, even if you planted it, six weeks later it would catch up mm -hmm. but it might be smaller in stature it might put on a smaller ear is that kind of what you expect to see in the field corn out there this year definitely the production corn that's what we're hearing from our field agronomists particularly where it was really really wet um, in northern and nor north central northwestern iowa smaller stature corn uh, smaller ears as you mentioned uh, <clears throat> And again, I'm uh, unfortunately some guys up there are not going to get a, a crop out just how wet it was uh, in that northwest corner, getting over into into South Dakota with uh, flood flood waters and precipitation over three to four days that you wouldn't see in a full season. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, that's where we are in pockets in northwestern Iowa. Uh, but generally, in my field scouting and hearing from my colleagues across the Corn Belt. Uh, Iowa's corn and beans are looking uh, particularly good. Well, that's good to hear. I, I love hearing that report. Uh, over the long holiday weekend, I actually heard uh, one report that they were thinking on their longer range outlooks, maybe a week out or so, uh, in this case, maybe by this coming weekend, they were looking at a chance of freezing temperatures up in the northern plains. Uh, does that kind of jive with what you see on your research too or not? Those early, uh, the early indicators for frost and freeze, you know, it's really hard to forecast those in those climatological outlooks that are issued each day by the Climate Prediction Center. They'll give us an idea of the large scale setup in the atmosphere that potentially could bring colder air down across the upper Midwest. When you're looking at the outlooks right now, getting into the middle of September, there really isn't a strong signal for colder temperatures. Now, I did look at the forecasts uh, for the upper Midwest, the Dakotas and the Minnesota, seeing overnight lows uh, towards the end of the week, getting back into the upper 30s. Uh, we're not seeing any semblance of the potential for frost or freeze. And what we like to tell people, my colleagues, my state climatologist colleagues, regional climatologists, look at those trends in the outlooks that you're seeing. And if you start to see that trend towards a, a cooler probability, then the next thing we look at is the seven to 10 day forecast that actually gives us a range of temperatures that we can expect. Because those climate, those climate uh, forecasts that we use are probabilistic. So they're giving us an idea of, uh, are we going to be above or below average, but not by how much? Unless you're seeing what we call the big blue bullseye, which is 80 or 90% probability of being colder than average, then a, a rule of thumb there is generally temperatures can be 10 to 20 degrees below average. Luckily, we're not seeing that. Uh, and if you look at the 30-year averages as well, we've actually increased the growing season, pushing those uh, killing frosts and freeze further into um, October. Uh, so that has another thing going for us in terms of the recent warmth that we've seen. That kind of leads me to my next question. I was going to ask you, in, in your territory, 
what kind of a first freeze date are you looking at? I know you have different zones uh, kind of through that region there. Yeah, of course, the, the climatologically, we would expect the first frost or freeze across northern Iowa and then a few weeks later across southern Iowa. So we're looking at, you know, 32 degrees or 28 degree uh, killing freeze uh, towards the middle to end of October. Now we've, of course, have had cold snaps. But if you look at the 30-year climatology, which is the last full three decades, 1991 to 2020, we're pushing those frost dates a few days further out uh, into fall, which can give us a buffer if uh, some of these farmers who uh, had delayed planting or had to repeat uh, planting um, uh, couldn't get in the field fast enough. So we do see a buffer there as well. With this La Nina that's potentially building in a 66% chance in the September, October, no November timeframe, we typically see warmer than average temperatures for meteorological fall with a uh, weak to moderate La Nina. Uh, so that also gives us some uh, confidence that temperatures are going to stay warmer uh, and that our climatological first frost and freeze should fall with where we expect those. But a lot of the corn is going to be mature um, and that frost or freeze shouldn't impact. So if that um, ENSO pattern would hold true through the winter, let's say, what does that mean for a, a winter in your part of the country there? <laughs> so it's difficult to to talk about La Nina's for Iowa or for the middle of the Corn Belt because we typically are in between the higher probabilities for colder temperatures across the upper Midwest, the Dakotas and into Minnesota, and then warmer temperatures across the Ohio Valley getting into the southern states. We're right in the middle of uh, the probabilistic features when we look at typical La Nina is going back to 1950. Uh, so it really depends on where that jet stream sets up a little further north. We could have warmer temperatures a little further south, uh, colder temperatures. But when we look at the overall precipitation behavior in winter for La Nina's, we see a big bullseye of above average precipitation chances in the Pacific Northwest and getting over into the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes. No real guidance for uh, my neck of the woods for Iowa in the central corn belt. Uh, so again, it really, it really determined where those three uh, jet streams, the polar, the subtropical jet sets up and uh, what kind of temperature behavior we see uh, in the middle. Now, 2020, 2021, and 2022 were three La Nina winters. Only the second time since 1950, we've had a triple dip La Nina. Uh, we had warm, air outbreaks. We had polar vortex outbreaks, particularly February is always a, a, a an interesting month uh, recently in the 30-year trend, more cold air outbreaks. But also, as I mentioned earlier, this February or this past February was one of the warmest on record, uh, and we didn't really have a snowpack on the ground. Uh, so yeah, with the, with the dominant climate driver being El Nino in a transition to La Nina, also looking at spring behavior, a record amount of severe weather across the state, 122 tornadoes. We typically see about 44 to 46 uh, per season. The last time we had that many tornadoes was back in 2004 uh, with 120 tornadoes. So with that severe weather, lots of rainfall, bust the drought, crop looks good. So it's all connected together. Well, it sounds like you're uh, almost the meat of the sandwich, if it, if you will, um, where you just kind of caught right in between everything. Absolutely. Um, we talked about the corn and the, the maturity of the corn across the state. When you were driving across the state here recently, what did you think of the soybeans? Do they look pretty normal, in your opinion, this year? They do. And uh, in eastern Iowa, in north, northeastern Iowa, you started to see some semblance of moisture stress, the, a little more grayish uh, across those fields, not that, that deep emerald green. And this is a reflection of a shorter-term precipitation deficits. Uh, but with the soil profiles that we have and the, the amount of moisture that we've received across much of the state, we're, the crop is holding on a, a lot better without these timely rainfalls, basically because of the temperatures have been so cool. But you look at last Monday and Tuesday when we had temperatures in the, the mid to upper 90s uh, with dew points in the 70s and low 80s, 
It's stagnant weather out there. August is the least windy month climatologically for Iowa. So when you have those warm temperatures and that tropical air, it just stagnates, doesn't move. Cuts down on moisture stress, but you don't want to be livestock out there or you don't want to be a human working outside in those conditions. But overall, uh, where you have seen some moisture stress in beans, I think uh, widespread, uh, they look really good. And uh, we had a rainfall event last week, anywhere from a half an inch to two plus inches across the majority of our National Weather Service stations. So that's the type of rainfall that you need when you start to see some semblance of moisture stress uh, developing in beans and um, it was much needed and much appreciated. I know anytime you get a, a tropical pool of air coming up in there like that, there is a concern about disease pressure. And I just wondered if you had any agronomists talk about that. Yes. You also think about the amount of insects that we've had with a warm winter, um, over overwintering pests uh, emerged faster, uh, and they've stuck around with the wet conditions that we've seen. So uh, it was interesting talking with uh, specialty crop growers and our field agronomist, uh, uh, corn uh, ear uh, corn worm earworm was very pervasive across the uh, sweet corn. Now again, we don't plant a ton of sweet corn across the state; it's production corn. Uh, but since it was the earlier uh, flowering and, and pollination and tasseling, uh, that was where the worms went to first. So uh, when you're shucking that sweet corn around the Fourth of July, lots of uh, worms in in the ear uh, and uh, Luckily, we got rid of that, but there has there is widespread uh, disease pressure out there as well. We've heard of uh, tar spot, uh, amongst other things. Uh, but overall, I think given the conditions that we've seen and coming off of four years of drought, uh, I'm optimistic with uh, the broad scale nature of our crop across the state. Well, Justin, that's good to hear. And uh, thank you so much for taking a few moments to update our audience on what's going on. Very important information, and uh, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, hopefully, we can maybe touch base after harvest or something and uh, get another update as we get toward winter time. But um, thanks again. Uh, great uh, stuff. I look forward to talking with you next time. Justin Glisson, and he's a state climatologist for the state of Iowa with us on today's episode. That will do it for producer Brianne Hendrickson. I'm Marlon Bowling, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Comstock Channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.